But if you start getting curious to what, what your inner dialogue is, that will at least help for the first step because without awareness, you can't do anything. All right, this is Morning Coffee, and I am Rick Alexander. Thanks for joining me for another episode. Today I'm joined by my co-host. You know her from Alpha Femme, Danielle McGinnis. She's also at dbird20, and she also frequents every other post on my Instagram. So Danielle's going to co-host this for me. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, babe. And today we are going to interview, i.e. just have a conversation with mindset coach, host of the Abundantly Clear podcast, Mallory Nicole. Hey, guys. Thanks I'm for so joining excited. Us. So there are a ton of different directions I feel like we could go with this conversation. I'm going to give you the mic for a minute and just let you talk about what it is that you do, and then we'll go from there. Cool. So I help entrepreneurs who have gotten to a certain point in their business. They've dialed in their marketing. They've dialed in pretty much how to leverage, and they are really struggling with stress and overwhelm. And for some reason, they're not experiencing their business the way that they wished or hoped or, or thought that they're life would be at the point that they have gotten themselves to. And what I help them do is really understand and reprogram their subconscious beliefs that are blocking them from experiencing life the way they want and making the money that they want to be making. Mm, That's great. So one thing that I'll say is I think that's amazing that you work with entrepreneurs, but I think every single human listening to this show knows the deal with uh, or knows what it's like intimately to deal with stress and overwhelm yeah absolutely i think it's an epidemic really that's taking over yeah and why do you think that is Uh, i think we find purpose in the word busy um as far as society is concerned you know it's like it's we shame we shame and put judgment on others if we don't identify ourselves as being busy people it's really common to ask somebody how are things going and their first response is oh everything's so busy Mm. As if like that's an acceptable and okay thing when really I think what we're kind of doing is, is filling some voids and identifying with busy as being equatable to worthiness. Equatable to worthiness. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like a badge of honor now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. And have you found that, I mean, especially with entrepreneurs, but just working with like, I, you know, people that listen to the show, so I feel like it's a very high performing population because mm-hmm. you don't listen to shows about growth if you're not at least interested in that area. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and it's like, so those people to me, it tends to be the case that people that are high performing individuals are the ones that tend to let ambition in the driver's seat of their lives. And they're the ones that sort of worship at the altar of just more, like more achievement, more success, more everything. Do you find that it's super hard to get people to walk backward from that belief? I think I think what's hard is admitting that they're trying to outwork the problem, first of all. So really having awareness to, I am creating this, you know, quote unquote, chaos or stress in my life. I think that's the hardest part for people to really look in the mirror and say, oh, my business isn't going the way that I want it to go. Maybe it's Maybe it's on me. Mm. And that's not to shame them at all. That's just looking at them and saying, that means you get to change. That means you get to explore. That means you get to look inside and look at what the internal beliefs are and why you're experiencing things the way that you are. I think that's the hardest part is really getting over that. It's okay for me to say that I'm not perfect and that I can create change and I'm okay with saying that. I think that's really where it starts. Mm. And, and yeah, that's an idea that I've been kind of grappling with a little bit lately and pushing is this idea that like you, you should hope that the problem is you because if it's the world, there's not a lot you can do about it. But if it's you, it gives you like a, the basis for some, to change something. Absolutely. And I think what this ties into, you know, you can tie in business and, and if you are listening to this and you don't have a business, we have a tendency to blame our stress on all of the external things going on around us. When really it's it's not at all all of those things. It's how we're experiencing those things. So a lot of business owners, for example, will blame their business on the way they feel. My business is is making me stressed out, or my business isn't doing well, or my business isn't making me enough money. When they are the runners of the business, so they are not putting themselves out there and taking ownership to create the money that they want it to create or create opportunity in their life. And then the alternative is if you have a career, you know, you can blame your job, you could blame your relationships, you could blame all these things, but you know, we're not trees, we can move at any point in time that we want. So whether it's your business or your career, if, if you are blaming all of the external things outside of you, you're really limiting your opportunity to facilitate change. 
Totally, yeah. So what, what is it that made you have that realization in the first place? <laughs> um, I, I think I actually struggled with it, to be completely honest. I think the victim mindset, and that's why I, you know, abundance and scarcity is something I talk so much about. The victim mindset and falling in line with scarcity is something that I really had a hard time with uh, for a very long time. And a lot of that is because of, you know, I, I will not blame this on my childhood. It's not that at all. But what a lot of the things I learned in my childhood, I didn't unlearn until much later. And mm-hmm. I needed to unlearn a lot of those things to be the person that I had the capability to be that I was not seeing. Um, there was a lot of stuff that I had not yet healed from that I was taking with me into my adult life that I was creating those limitations, but I didn't see it for what it was worth. And because of that, it was hindering me. Hmm. So for people, the, the people that are listening to the show, what do you think, how can someone start to figure out if that's them, right? Cause yeah. Yeah. How do you know? Like, yeah, because you, you only start? have the lens you look through, right? Right. So. I was going to ask you, like, yeah. how do you, like, gently hold up a mirror to someone that's, like, experiences, <laughs> yeah. like, this trauma feeling or this, you know, because, like, when you say, like, victim, like, it, you kind of think trauma, but, like, how do you gently hold up the mirror and say, like, not shame them, not mm-hmm. blame them? How do you do that? With your yeah, that's a really good question. I think, I think... I think the most powerful thing about coaching and conversation really, because coaching is sometimes a word that even though I consider myself a mindset coach, sometimes I don't feel like I identify with being a coach. Sometimes I just feel like I have conversations with people and help them. Yeah, I'm just a human, right? And it really is having those conversations and asking the questions to help them see the things that they might not be seeing. And I had people do that for me. I had people that asked me questions to help me gain my ability to see myself through the lens that I do now that I wasn't seeing before. For example, you can't really just tell, you can't really tell somebody what to do. I can't look at you and say, all right, this is what you need to fix your life. You need to go do this, 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 and this. You're going to get up from the table and walk away and go, you know, what's that girl's problem? Like, who does she think she is to put this kind of judgment on my life? And you're not going to do anything that I say, as you shouldn't, because that's not the way that we should communicate with each other. But if you are somebody that has curiosity and can have curious questions with people, you can really help them dig into curious curiosity with themselves in a way that maybe they not have experienced. So that's really kind of where it starts is helping people helping people uncover their own subconscious patterns and behaviors that they haven't realized themselves. Because if you look at science, and you might have talked about this before, so I don't mean to repeat any information that you could have shared on the show, but 97% of what we do is from our subconscious programming, Hmm. which means that we're pretty much walking around every single day doing stuff blindly. We don't realize the things that we're doing until we get curious. And I think that's really kind of where it starts. I'm curious about the tie-in between, you said, uh, sort of like talking about childhood beliefs and Mm -hmm. patterning programming there, and then what that has to do or what you see that having to do with an abundance mindset. Is it that most of us are programmed for scarcity or where, you know, like what what do you see as a connection there? It's weird because I think that it's not on purpose, but most of us are programmed for scarcity because if you really look at society, we're kind of taught to be fear-based. And, you know, that's just the truth of it. It's not, it, it, it's not exciting to say that. But when you look at the way that we go to school and the way we learn through education and the way that we're told, you know, you have to um, do this to go get a job and you have to work 40 hours a week to make this amount of money and that's all you're ever going to be able to do. We create a lot of limitations to ourselves and what our full potential is and what we can create. You know, there's people that create TV shows and create Uh, universities and create all these crazy things that write books. You know, you're an author, you've written a book, but did you grow up in a house where your mom and dad every single day put a pen and paper in front of you and said, you can be an author if you want to be an author? You know, we don't really live like that. And and it's not even because there's a bunch of bad parents out there. Um, You know, some parents are maybe not the greatest in the world, but it's the scarcity mindset doesn't just happen from a place of my, my parents were bad and I was raised in a place of scarcity. It really just comes from not looking at what we have the potential to create. And so then we walk around not seeing what we have the potential to create. Hmm. That That's something I, I grapple with in my life just because of the nature of the show and, and being an author is like, 
you know, I'm I'm in this position where I'm like create, and I'm sure that you can, you you feel this on some level, but I'm like creating everything I do. I'm just thinking it up essentially, but it it resonates pretty deeply with people, especially like the work I'm doing with the Clarity Academy and stuff. Yet for me to have this lifestyle and these beliefs, like I have felt like the heretic my whole mm-hmm. entire life, and I feel like. And it, like that's almost my role in society, and I, I keep asking myself, like, why is that? Like, what? And do, I, do you struggle with that? And have you felt that? Like, you're almost against the grain with these beliefs of abundance. Yeah, and- I think it can be hard because you are using, you know, you are using social media platforms for the most part to share your message. And whatever social media platform you're using, there's a good chance there's a lot of people on that platform that are watching you from day one to day wherever you are through your journey and they see that first batch of (laughs) what is this person talking about like all of a sudden she just went from posting photos about from her dog going on hikes on the weekends now she's talking about all this stuff about personal power and inner childhood beliefs and stress and where did this come from yeah um you know that's something i've definitely experienced as an entrepreneur is making that shift and being vocal about the things that I believe. And I have built a Facebook platform and I've got a podcast and all this stuff, but we were just talking about this earlier. I still don't really use Instagram. Hmm. And I've just never, it's never really clicked with me. And part of me wonders, is that because that's more of like a family friends platform for me? And is that something I'll ever use for my business? You know, I think that, I think I'd be lying and I think we'd all be lying if entrepreneurs said that's not something that we experience because it really is, it's a message that is absolutely against the grain. Hmm. So the thing that I struggle with in with wanting to purvey the message, because to me it does feel like, again, I, I, it seems like it resonates pretty deeply with people, but the thing that I struggle with is it seems like you also have to have a bit of an appetite for risk. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you start, uh, when you have a message like you do, there's a chance that you inspire people to do things that other people would consider to be crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And like, where's the responsibility? Like, how do you feel as far as... It, does everyone have the ability to create their own life like this? In courage. Yeah, I think a lot of it does lie in courage because courage, you know, well, let me retract. We're scared to do things. We're always going to be scared to do things. The first time you go do a Facebook Live or the first time you put an Instagram post out or the first time you, you know, quit your job because you want to start your own business or the first time you date someone new, it can be scary. But courage is how we help get over that. Courage is the part where we tap into that inner voice to be able to say, I know this is scary, but I have courage in myself to do it anyways. And I think a lot of people fight fear, thinking that the fear is just gonna go away when sometimes the fear doesn't go sometimes the fear doesn't go away. You have to do it scared. Yeah. And that's no, okay. Yeah, psychologically the fear does not go away. Yeah. So like that's that's why um, in a in a when you, if you listen to it in a clinical setting what they look for is is to slowly introduce you to the behavior or to the action that you're scared of mm-hmm. uh, because the idea is that you actually do have to build courage and you're not going to be able to reduce fear so you actually in the face of what you're afraid of actually you don't really have a choice mm-hmm. yeah yeah but, yeah and I think it like lies in like a balance of like curiosity courage and then just surrender. Yes, surrender is such, I thank you for sharing, saying that word because surrender is, it, that deeply resonates with me because surrender is trust in self. And if we don't have trust in self, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? If we are just showing up to push and push and push and we never let go, then we're just putting all this force and control and scarcity into the action that we're taking. So really, we're going into the fear with fear. We're never letting go of the fear. And then what we're, whatever we've created doesn't have the ability to continue to perpetuate to create into what it could. So that's a perspective on surrender that I don't think I've ever heard. So, you, so when you say surrender, you're saying you're equating that to a like a deep trust in in your own ability to do what you need to do yeah i think trust in self is the biggest advantage that we have and it's something that we often skip over because we look for the outside sources if i can just figure out how to make instagram work then i'll be good if i can just figure out how to make facebook work then i'll be good when really you know if you don't figure out how to make one of those work you'll just if you trust yourself you'll find something else you'll figure out something else you'll go start a podcast you'll tap into another network you'll figure it out but you you have to know that and truly believe that in order to take the action and kind of step back and watch it all unfold 
But what about people that don't have that belief in themselves? Like, how do you start repairing that? Because that's... Go to Clarity Academy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was telling you the other day about... Um, I'm reading this book called Loving Bravely, and it talked about the concept of, like, gut instincts and, like, mm-hmm. really, like, leaning into that and allowing space for that and, like, the difference between, like, an anxious gut feeling mm-hmm. and then an actual, like, visceral, like, raw, like, pulling at your soul. Like, it doesn't feel right feeling. Yeah. Like, anxious is, like, more, like, tense and, like feels lighter than that like visceral like maybe I shouldn't be pursuing this or maybe I shouldn't be doing that um do you agree with that I totally agree with that and there's some exercises that I've done with people it'd be a little bit hard to do it on here but there's some exercises that you can do to tap into kind of what areas of the body are you feeling that from so a lot of times um you know if you close your eyes and you have two different scenarios for trying to make a decision and you're stepping into two different scenarios on one hand, you might feel like a tightness in your chest. Well, that tightness is create, that's that feeling of anxiety. That anxiety is probably steering you away from the thing that you're trying to make a decision from. Now, if you take yourself to the other situation, have your eyes closed and imagine yourself doing, you know, what the alternative is and you feel some kind of like butterflies in your stomach. Well, that's a, that's an indicator that you're excited about something. And excitement and fear are something that I think can be very challenging to differentiate which one am I actually feeling. I think a lot of people struggle with that. But I believe that our bodies are communicating with us far more than we give our bodies the ability to communicate with us. We don't listen to it often enough. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, and I think what you're describing right now is the reason that it's so prevalent for people to not understand themselves because we're so nuanced. Like you're you're having a feeling about something that you want to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's so hard to parcel all of your feelings apart and understand like, is this good or is this bad feeling? Like I, it's definitely a feeling. And it's like, if it's not so objective, it is pretty difficult to know, especially if you're doing something um, that there's not a lot of path laid out for. Yeah. And it's, it's challenging because I think we also have a tendency to make the most logical decision. I mean, that was definitely a card that I played. What's the most logical scenario? You know, I came from an engineering background. Like if you don't have logic in what you're doing in engineering, stuff falls apart. Literally stuff falls apart. You have to do what with what's on paper. Uh, And nothing in my business has been logical. Mm. It's all working so far. Great for me. But it hasn't been logical. If you look back at a lot of the decisions I made, it's like, why did I make that? That's that's, uh, you know, that could be, a lot of people could think that was stupid or silly or a bad investment or about this or about that. But it was because there was that gut feeling or instinct that I was supposed to follow calling. Yeah. So and- what about the fe- the people who, um, like me growing up, I was kind of just like ignored my feelings. Mm-hmm. So do you deal with that with people in business that are like so on autopilot that they yeah. just like can't feel feelings and they're like what is a gut feeling yes absolutely because that was me I didn't know how to feel my feelings either I grew up in a you know to give you a little bit of insight I grew up in a childhood that was I didn't grow up in an abusive household but I grew up in a household that wasn't always safe so my little childhood brain told me as I grew into adulthood that feelings aren't safe and that the world is not a safe place to exist. So that is what I walked around believing and seeing. And I lived through that lens. And because of that, I repressed a lot of my feelings and my ability to tap in and be honest with myself about, you know, emotions. Emotions were something that I didn't even know that I wasn't comfortable with, but I was very not comfortable with them. And I think more than we realize and I'll also interject this. You do not have to be somebody that doesn't feel your feelings just because you grew up in a household like that. A lot of people didn't, and they still have repressed emotions and don't have the ability to tap into that. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's like, it feels like it's like a survival mechanism from getting through the world, because if you go around feeling everything, you end up pretty, you end up feeling pretty crappy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's a, it's a really interesting, um, Mother Teresa, so people listening to this show actually can't see me, but Mother Teresa used to use her hands and she would go over her chest before she would every single day. And what she said she was doing is basically like putting this cloak on herself because Mm -hmm. she was like, I can't absorb the feelings of every single person I help because Mm -hmm. I won't be able to help anybody else. That's really interesting. Yeah, it is. And it's like, and I think that what you see in our society today is like everybody's either an empath 
and they like just are it's like always raining and they're super sad mm-hmm. or it's like the opposite of that which is like the go-getter the alpha what people think of as alpha um probably a skewed image of it but this person that just sort of like bashes through the world and just does right. whatever they want and takes what they need and like it's like a zero-sum game yeah absolutely right absolutely. it's like everyone's either the pope or trump and it's like but what about all of us in the Do middle you think, like in your business it's like coming down to a concept of like um trying to take like human doers to like human beings it's yeah it's a lot it's that's a really really beautiful way to explain it it's a lot of let's cut out the word do and let's start being because like less a lot performance of, based more just being based so the performance doesn't so much change if anything the performance enhances Because what people start to realize is that a lot of what's in the doing basket doesn't actually need to exist. And they've put a bunch of things in their basket. You know, this is an invisible basket that we're talking about. But they put a bunch of things in their basket that they feel like they're supposed to be doing or have to be doing that's really creating a lot of blocks from being true to the things that they could be doing that are allowing them to grow. So the to-do list gets smaller, the stress decreases, and they do start to show up from a more intentional place, uh, you know, living in the present and existing in the be. That's a really good way to explain it. And a lot of people ask, well, what, what do you actually do? Well, it's not so much do. I don't tell people sp- specifically to do things. Of course, there's homework and stuff that will help people as they progress, and that's all custom. But this is really about thought. This is about how people are showing up to their day-to-day life. So to circle it back with with this, where, where we're at sort of in society, because, you know, we were, me and Danielle were talking earlier, there does seem to be some sort of consciousness revolution happening right mm-hmm. now. Like, okay. And I think that's probably, um, honestly, a lot because of this, because of the podcast mm-hmm. platform and all these new media outlets are just giving all of these intelligent, long form voices a more, they're getting, they're becoming more prevalent. Mm-hmm. So, but there's still this problem where we are these nuanced people that are sort of these nuanced creatures that are sort of in Western culture for sure really pushed toward being human doings, right? And we are pushed toward that. And then I think there's like a almost, you know, it's like right now you can see the entrepreneur conversation for sure is like hustle at all costs. Mm-hmm. And, and so mm-hmm. it's like when you have these people that are disconnected from their own feelings and they don't understand the nuances and they don't understand that that they can just be and that they can just... So how do they start trusting themselves? That's a trap I think a lot of people are in right now. And that's... I think that's why I feel so called to the message that that I believe in because they don't know. They don't know what they don't know until they see it and until they start to learn. And there's a really... There's a really tight connection between suicide and startup failures mm. <laughs> actually which really? is really sad yeah it's yeah. really sad um but you know i would say i th- i think that investing in yourself is something that all business owners could benefit from whatever that looks like for you that could look like some person that you've been following that you're interested in that could look like a group coaching program that could look like going to some type of retreat that could look like some type of self exploration but i think that you allowing yourself to be the best version of you results in the best version of your business so hand in hand in hand you're you're creating an investment in your business as well but you can't really force that or preach that or you know tell all the business owners out there you have to do this or you're going to fail because they're not they're still going to make a bunch of money and they're still going to figure it out but are they going to do it from a place of fulfillment and are they going to do it feeling the way that they want to feel and i don't i don't know anything other than to just keep sharing the message that i share Mm. and people like you to keep sharing the message that you share to bring awareness to it because i truly believe it's an epidemic I, I think too. it's an epidemic that's really, it's dangerous. Do you have to like shift the mindset of, fa- like the mindset around failure to the clients that you work with? Like, mm-hmm. do they think that like failure is the end of the world? Because yes. a lot of high performers do. Absolutely. And failure is usually a childhood programming thing that is normally around middle school. Yeah. That's usually where our perfection behavior started. Um, but until we realize, you know, what is the root of it, 
we don't know the lens to look through from a place of non-judgment. Because that's really, if you think about it, that's really where that freedom lies is when we stop judging ourselves and we stay curious. But you can't, you know, you can't just read, oh, stop judging yourself and stay curious on the side of a billboard and go, oh, okay, I have it figured out now. <laughs> because as you guys, you guys know, it's a life journey. We're never going to have it all figured out. But the perfection patterns usually tie deeply into worthiness and where did you find that worthiness and a lot of people found it through getting good grades at school so if you think about that you got good grades yeah you got good grades in school and then you go start a business and you didn't make a sale well what did you just make it mean about you that you didn't make that sale Mm. does that make sense like it's it's so connected and deeply intertwined like that but people don't realize that oh when i don't make a sale i'm literally making it mean that i'm a pile of crap yeah, we were talking about this that is this the morning. emotion that I'm feeling. Yeah. Like something didn't go right or like mm-hmm. something happened and I was like, oh, well, like, and then it, like, I got a message from somebody and I was like, oh, well, now I feel good. And I'm like, but why was there like a drastic shift in mm-hmm. my behavior, mm-hmm. my mood? And I'm like, that's got to be like an ego. Yeah, it, it's all ego. It's all <laughs> ego. And the ego is, the ego tries to tell you that it's protecting you and trying to help you live into your fullest, but it isn't. It, that's an illusion in itself. And most of what we tell ourselves until we start living consciously, most of what we tell ourselves in these patterns and these traps, they're all just illusions, but we don't realize it. We don't know that these illusions are there because we've never had somebody that's helped us dig underneath and go, hey, do you realize that you're, this is the pattern that you're living in? Do you realize that this is what you're doing? He's really good at doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm I know you are. <laughs> I think this this failure, this like fear of failure, I think is legitimately why people can't surrender. Because I feel like they're mm-hmm. like, what do you mean? There's too much to do. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Right? And it's like, how do you how do you bridge that gap for someone that there isn't actually a line between what how much you're doing and how much you're succeeding? Custom for everyone. Yeah. And. I always get, I always get super stuck on, on that because that in itself is like, how do you tell someone exactly how to do it? Totally. Cause you got to do With something like, for sure. Right. But how do you tell someone how to do it when it's about being, so you can't tell someone how to do it. You have to help them learn how to be it. Yeah. And you know, the thing, yeah, I don't know, but I think <laughs> like the thing I've been exploring in my newest book is this idea that like what you do, like who you are what you do should be an extension of who you are, Mm -hmm. but who you are should not be contingent on what you do. Absolutely. And it's like in, and until it is, because the thing is, once you figure out, I think really, at least for me, once I really figured out like maybe who I am or who I believe I am and I was secure in that, then it's like everything else is an additive. Mm -hmm. It's like, bring it, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't need it though. Mm -hmm. So much so that even like the Clarity Academy, I was telling Daniel earlier, the Clarity Academy is doing well right now as far as selling to people. And I almost don't like how happy I get about that because I'm like, but then if it weren't to do good, then would I hate myself? So I'm like, I've... Ah, well, why are you excited that it's doing good? Because I bet you're excited that it's doing good for reasons other than you think. Yeah, and, and hopefully it's altruistic reasons. Because, I mean, it is, it's the message I love, right? It's like I've made my entire life about this message, and I, I, I cannot stand when people grow up feeling bad about who they are. Yeah, and, and, and the then cl- totally should be something celebrated. Yeah, totally. But I see what you're saying. To get stuck in that, am I falling into the own trap of perfection, or am I still staying authentic to my values? Putting your identity yeah. in right. what right. you do versus... You are right. right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And I think when you put your identity in what you do, you you two things. One, everything is ephemeral, so it's for sure gonna go away. It just depends on when. But the two is like the the second part of that for me. What I found and what brought me on this journey is that like no matter what, it would never be enough. Mm-hmm. It would always mm-hmm. like I you just live on this hedonic treadmill, and it's like no matter what you accomplish or what you do, it's never gonna be enough. And no. so you're always gonna be just hungry for the next thing. And that hunger is something that's exciting, but we have to be careful of where that line, you know, that's what you're saying right now. We have to be careful about how much we let that hunger take over creating the beliefs about who we are at the end of the day, not being someone that we know we have the potential to be because there's a lot of coaching that is backed by fear. You know, I see, you've probably seen it. I see it all the time. There are coaching methods that will push you 
so deeply because the pain hurts too much to face the pain and that's something that I struggle with a little bit just as far as what we're teaching society because we're actually teaching people to put so much energy into the pain that's it's like a law of polarization right there but that can be kind of dangerous just to have somebody wake up every day and say oh it would hurt so bad not to do this so this is why I'm going to do it this way like the fear of being average yeah right yeah 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 how That's bad would you feel about yourself if you didn't do this? Like, are those really the questions that we want to be asking ourselves? Is that really actually empowering? Or then are we just operating from a place of polarizing our disempowerment? You know, it's kind of dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. You know what I think, at least, and I've, I don't know, for whatever this is worth in my own life, I just found that it will get you to a point. Mm-hmm. But that point isn't necessarily where you want to end up. Yeah. It's not where yeah, you want to Yeah, stay. yeah, it can, You'll reach your goals. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially, yeah, yeah. You will get to your goals for yeah. sure. And but then are that they fulfilling, well, right? They right. won't be fulfilled, so right. it'll be the next goal and the next goal. And I think when your hunger is driven by a need for identity, it is almost a scarcity mindset mm-hmm. because it's yeah. like there isn't. I have to get, like I have to get in order to feel good enough. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't know if we've ever talked about this. I feel like we might have talked about this a couple weeks ago. I am not a super hard goals driven person. Hmm. It's more process, like. We can't, we can't decipher what's going to happen. I can't look at now and the end of the year and go, oh, I know that these opportunities are going to come up against or come, come into my life and that those are the things that I should do and that's where I should go and be. But I think there is, at least I'm trying to find the balance and have been committed to finding the balance of staying true to what I want to create, but not letting these big goal-driven numbers and things and X, Y, Z hinder the way that I show up because Mm. when we don't need those quotas basically what we're saying to energy universe god you know whatever you believe is yeah it doesn't (laughs) matter oh you didn't do this fast enough and these things didn't happen fast enough for me so now I no longer trust Mm. and then we stop trusting in ourselves to create too I think that that is very correlated to like because we had a podcast last week about conscious relationships Mm -hmm. so if you looked at like the typical relationship in society the goal would be marriage, Mm -hmm. right? So it's like, if you don't get married, then does that mean you're failing? Mm -hmm. Because you're not getting married? But like every day we're like, okay, I choose you today. Mm -hmm. So maybe it comes down to like teaching people choosing taking one choice towards that path Mm -hmm. because you're choosing to live intentionally in the relationship that that you're in versus we have to get here it's much more organic Mm -hmm. but you're using that space as kind of like a classroom to learn along the way yeah that makes total sense that's cool yeah total so one thing that i do i want to explore this idea that you just brought up of of not being super goal driven um because i think well, you know what? I, I've started to figure out, this is a thought I had today, randomly enough, is that like timing is almost always divine in mm-hmm. some way, whatever you believe to be mm-hmm. divine, but in like a ultimate good. And that timing always works. And so then there's like, you can fight that and that's like panic mode, but you know that like deep down forcing, it's never actually going to work out. Mm-hmm. But then, so, but then, so like actually like living in rhythm with divine timing is somewhere between, uh, just being it's somewhere between like appreciating and just being and intention mm-hmm. right and there's like a, or surrender and intention yeah. is a great way to put it yeah and it's like how with how do you find that like how do you find that process i think it's really important for everyone to be committed to their why um in owning a business but also that can translate into that can translate into anybody that has a career or a job or maybe you don't maybe you have the job of being a mother or a father because that's a job in itself and knowing the intention of why why are you showing up why are you choosing to show up you know maybe it's wednesday and that's great it's wednesday but why is it wednesday to you and what's important about that Mm. and we have a tendency to live on such an autopilot program that we forget sometimes you know how much time has passed what's gone on in the week or the day uh that's something i've experienced a lot with business owners i'll start working with someone and they're like i feel like i'm exactly where i was last year this time last year i feel like nothing's changed and uh, i'll start asking questions like well you know what is your what does your revenue look like now compared to what it looked like last year and the numbers are drastically different. And what does your health look like? And what does your personal development look like? And everything's like completely different. And then they they wake up for a minute and they're like, oh, 
you know, my life is completely different than it was this time last year, but I didn't realize it. Mm. And it's not because they hadn't changed anything. It's just because they were not quite yet living from this space of intention and, and presence and recognizing where they were and why they were there and what they had created. And I think that kind of translates into every area of our life. When we have a tendency to just kind of move through things, we don't create intention. And when we don't create intention, we also block the ability to surrender. Because the two really go hand in hand. If you're not if you're not surrendering, you're not creating intention. If you're not creating intention, you're not surrendering. They're kind of two parts of the process, but really they work together. Totally. But how can you create intention without having goals? I think that's where I'm getting lost. How can you create intention without having goals? What is important to you about having the business? What is important to you about doing the things that you're doing? So, so a lot of business owners find themselves um, stuck in these goals of, I want to make a million dollars within my first two years of business. Well, that's... You know, that's great, but what if you could see your future and see that making that million dollars in the time that you wanted to make it was like the most miserable thing for you? That every day for those two years, you're going to be suffering. It was going to be super stressful. And to get to the number that you wanted to in that two years was going to be absolutely um, exhausting. Mm. And what if you could also see that to get it in three years was perfect it was divine Mm. all the opportunities came to you you created and took the step in all the opportunities that came and there was just just great correlation between the two and everything just happened to fall in place the way you wanted if you could see both of those paths would you say oh no i want to take the three-year route or would you still say no i want to suffer for two years to make the million dollars right Right. most people would go no i mean i would do another year to make a million and three like that's a no-brainer and it's not that we we can't have goals, but it's just when we forget to create intention behind our goals, hmm. then we get lost. Like, why is it actually important to you to make a million dollars in two years? You know, what is the underlying reason you're going to wake up every day? Because if you're just waking up every day just for the thing, you're going to forget why. And I talk a lot about money, and I don't think I don't think it's wrong to desire or want money. I think we actually should desire more than we than we on average do because we limit ourselves and that a lot. But when we get too hard into the, I I want this and I want that and I want this and I want that, we're putting control around the way that we feel like things have to happen. When we put too much control around it, we really block our ability to receive things that maybe we didn't even know were gonna come about. You know, maybe, Maybe there's an opportunity for you to go on TV in three weeks that you don't know about. And somebody's going to come into your life and invite you to be on a TV show that you didn't know that that was going to happen. But you were so focused on your goals that you ignored the conversation Mm. with that person because it was so important to you to get five new clients that month. Right? right, that you saw that you saw an email from somebody and you totally ignored it because you just were so focused on the way you thought things had to be. Yeah, does that make sense? It does, and and that's what I've experienced as well. Is if you become too focused on the goal, then everything in your life becomes in the way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's like, but exactly. that's your life that's mm-hmm. happening right now. So you're like, you're just looking at everything in your life as if it's at something in your way or an obstacle or like. It's kind of like if someone, if you're walking to get to a meeting on time and someone stops and tries to talk to you, right? It's like that person is in your way. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like, when really, life. I think it's the, it's the exact opposite. Everything in our life, you know, there's a reason the three of us are sitting here at this table having this conversation. Maybe we don't know what that reason is right now, but down the line we'll go, oh, wow, that makes so much sense why we all, we're all brought together. And when when we have that that loop and that uh you know it's kind of like a fishbowl when mm. we're looking at things through a fishbowl we don't see the opportunities because everything is an opportunity but we have to make sure that we're operating from a place of abundance and from a place of power to take the step to create the opportunity as well do you think it's like shifting your connection from the goal to like connection to your why connection to people connection yeah. to the serving others mm-hmm. so like Absolutely. you're shifting what you're being connected to mm-hmm. and then you're much more present and aware of like what's being presented to yes you. absolutely and i wouldn't you know if you're listening to this and you're like do you do you think i should just not have goals definitely not <laughs> like definitely not there are things i'm working on right now there are things i'm you know uh, trying to create and all that kind of stuff but 
I think when we, we exactly like Allow you were just space, saying, yeah, when we stop what creating is, space, exactly. like the good and the bad things that are happening that maybe they won't look like they're going to get you to, to your goal, but little do you know, like that's going to like shoot you to the moon. Exactly. And if that right there, maybe your goal is supposed to actually happen faster than you think it's supposed to, to happen. And then you've limited yourself from seeing that opportunity as well. Hmm. That is tip. I typically use like a buy date for my goal mm-hmm. because that just I like to leave space for it to happen sooner. Right, right. Um, and then there's also the part where it's like, you know, because like a lot of times, like we're talking about timing. It's like when you set a goal, it's like a lot of times things will happen and they're not going to happen on your timeline. And <laughs> yeah, that gets it's really so true. tough to me. I did my Clarity Academy goals. Literally, I set ten year goals and I accomplished them. <laughs> four months yeah. that is amazing <laughs> it was like all this stuff was happening i was like oh maybe i just needed to speak speak it to existence i don't know yeah I, there's a lot of there's a lot of truth to that you do you've got to believe and speak into existence the things that you want to achieve before they're achievable because if you don't believe it who's going to make it happen right so where do you fall on the when well let me just say this what what is your reaction to the word manifestation Oh, that's a great question. I was actually just doing a doing an interview with somebody today on my podcast and that word came up. Um, I think people get really confused about what that word means. And I think there is a little bit of a misunderstanding personally uh, into what I've seen people assume it as. And the word action, I think, has a lot to do with manifestation. Mm, that's the part people miss, I mm-hmm. think. When we just sit around and think with without also showing up to our lives to take action we're not really manifesting anything Mm. so we could sit around and think all day long about how you want to have the greatest podcast in the whole world and how you want to reach a million people but you never ever decide to buy a mic and set up a podcast and start recording stuff you're never going to have a podcast right and then you get frustrated and angry why don't i have a podcast well because you haven't taken the action to build the podcast right And I think a lot of people get stuck in this. Well, I I thought about it and I meditated on it and I did this, but you're forcing manifestation when manifestation is just allowing, allowing creation to happen Mm. while you're also showing up to create as well. Yeah, absolutely. And there's like all these new flavors of manifestation, like Joe Dispenza's work and like making contact with the quantum field. And there's like as far back as like psycho cybernetics, which is like, believe it, see it. So uh, vividly that your physiology would, would react in accordance with it, right? Mm-hmm. But I think that the thing to that you just mentioned that is really, really worth thinking about for people is this idea that if you're thinking, by definition, you're not in the world. Mm-hmm. And so, like, you're not actually, like, engaging with the world if you're thinking. It's like, you can think about the past, right? That actually doesn't exist anywhere except for when you're thinking about it because it no longer is a thing. And so I think people tend to, this is something I fall into all the time because I'm always thinking up my world. <laughs> and so it's like, but then you get in these points where it's like, well, you're, you'll just go around and around mm-hmm. in thought. And if you never actually take a step forward or engage with reality, then all of that thought is, is useless. Yeah. And I've read both of those books. And if you really think about it, okay, let's use logic in this case. All of the people that talk about manifestation, you've read their books, you've seen their TV shows, you've heard the things that they've put out, they've spent a lot of time taking action in their business. So were they really just sitting around and thinking? Right. (laughs) Or were they finding a relationship between both to create the things that they did in their life? Yeah. Well, I I found, um, and I put a post on this on Instagram today, because it was like, no Instagram or no meme can change your life. Yeah, but the good news true. is that you can change your life. And I think people get paralyzed because they're like, they they try to think their way out of a situation. And it's like, no, you actually have to act your way out of a situation. Absolutely. It can catalyze Absolutely. it for sure. Like you, you can see something and it can catalyze that manifestation or whatever. But like you ultimately have to act upon it. Or well, we're take always manifesting. Call. You know, yeah. we're manifesting something. something. Yeah, something. And we get to decide what, it, how we want to show up to that. Yeah. You know, I don't think that it makes a lot. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to just say we can write something down five hundred times and expect it to come like true. An affirmation sort of thing. 
Well, I do believe that, that, that there's a lot of power in that. I do believe in writing because what you're actually doing, but that's a little bit different. What you're actually doing with writing is you're reprogramming your subconscious mind to believe it as if it's happened. So if you write things in the present tense and you're basically tricking your brain, you're hacking yourself into the reality that you're living in. Mm. And I there's am. a lot of power in that. There is. I've been doing that for quite a few years. And if I look back on my journals, I'm like, oh my gosh, that stuff actually came true. But I can't just expect that I can wake up every day and write, I'm, I'm a millionaire. And then all of a sudden I'm going to wake up and there's going to be a million dollars in my bank account. Right. Right. Yeah. Totally. And I think that there's a, I heard an exercise today. It's like everyone is big into gratitude work right now. And you can write down, like people write down 10 things they're grateful for and then uh, I heard a flair on that. It's like, which is what you could do is write down 10 things you're grateful for that actually haven't happened yet. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. be so vividly, really grateful for those things. Actually feel like what it would feel like to actually get those things. Yes. That's and that awesome. to me feels like a much more productive way of going about figuring out what you want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And okay. So something I do want to uh, get to before we end this conversation, mm-hmm. something we've like sort of gone in and out of you've mentioned a few times and your podcast is called the abundantly clear podcast Mm -hmm. so i know that there's there's a there's a deep like truth in in abundance that like runs through your message i think when people think of of abundance and scarcity and the things that we're talking about the way that it affects them the most viscerally is with the way that they view money yeah yeah and uh if I think if we're right, like which the the hypothesis that most of us are brought up to be scarcity mindset, mm-hmm. that would mean that that would also fall into alignment with how you view money, which would mm-hmm. also affect you negatively. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I think there is a lot of shame actually, and if you look at an index of consciousness, shame is just about the lowest on the scale, and the feeling that we experience of shame and money, I think we really block ourselves from receiving. And I think we're really supposed to be on this planet to receive as much as we want. And when we look at business, you know, people that make a lot of money in business are doing it because there's a value exchange there. So they're doing something and they're receiving money for it. So if you really think about it, business owners that are receiving a lot of money, they're giving a lot. You know, you can make judgments on what the things are that they're giving. That's up to you. We could we could talk about that for hours on a different topic. But all it is is an exchange of value. Sure. But because of all of these limiting beliefs that we've created about what it means to have money and what it means to live a rich and wealthy life and what it means to receive money for services. You know, I've worked with women and men, and I know a lot of women – struggle with receiving money for a service that they are offering somebody because they just feel like they're supposed to give it to them. Well, you would not go to a nine to five or corporate job and say, well, I'm just supposed to work for free. Right. You, you would never do that. You would receive your paycheck as you do every other Friday or every Friday or whenever you get your paycheck because you would expect it. But for some reason, when people start businesses, it's like they lose, they, they just start to live in this world just with their beliefs and all of these blocks start to show up. And one of them really is the ability to receive money and what it means to do that because there is so much shame around being, being someone of wealth. Uh, I mean, there's TV shows alone. I was thinking about this the other day. There are TV shows alone just to shame people that are wealthy, to make them look stupid, to Mm. put the drama of them in our lives so that we can look at the most wealthy people in the world and go, oh my God, they're bad people. (laughs) Like, it's really crazy when you think about it. It is a pervasive narrative. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. And I think that it's not something that just affects business owners either. I think it affects the whole planet in this concept that paper is bad, but it's it's literally just paper. Right. And when you're thinking about a business, you are just giving. You are giving and you're receiving on the other end. And everybody that's giving should be receiving. Hmm. So why, why do you have any theories on why we have that uh, blockage? against? Beliefs? Well, just that. Well, the limiting beliefs I definitely do want to get to, but also this negative view of somebody that makes money. Do you think that's to make ourselves feel comfortable about not having it? Like, where do yeah, you think that I is? think you know, I think that really it's only people that don't have money that say that. Yeah. If you think about it, I mean, totally. it's yeah. people that have money don't Nobody's say that with about money. It's yeah. Like, I'm a real yeah. son of a bitch. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't know if you can cuss on this podcast. Yeah. yeah how yeah. much you can, you can go? But there, there's you know, I've heard people say before, 
only poor people say that. And I think there's a lot of truth to it because it's just a mirror for the things that you want. But it's not so much a mirror that you want the money as much as it's a mirror for you want to be somebody who looks at yourself through a lens of, I see myself as somebody that deserves to receive at that level. Mm. And do you think that's the fundamental disconnect that most people have? Absolutely. They just don't think they're even worthy of making that Mm -hmm. much money. I think our relationship with money has a lot to do with worthiness, but we look at it as paper and we look at it as money and we look at it as as, uh, finances, but it has everything to do with how we're feeling inside. Mm. I've worked with business owners that have been making multi six figures and they haven't looked at their bank statements in months or weeks because they're so frightened and scared of really wanting to face what's going on because of lack of control, because Mm. of fear, because of what if I screw it all up? You know, money has a, there's a lot of patterns with money. Some people feel like they reject it and don't make what they want. But then there's also the other side of it too. That's there's a lot of people that make a lot of money and they get rid of it real quick. They will do anything they can to get rid of the money they make. And that's just as poisonous as repelling it. Yeah. And and do you think that's because they see themselves just by virtue of self-awareness, they see themselves as someone that like shouldn't have that money. Yeah. And so it's like self-destruct mode to put me where I belong in the universe or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll do anything I can to get rid of this money as quick as possible because I'm not somebody who's worthy of having this kind of money. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. I think I might need that. So, <laughs> to be honest. So, okay, so for, so like, what are you buying? Well, that? and it changes, you know, it, you, who is you, I, I, this goes, this isn't like you, Rick, but you, anybody, you who are you, who's a business owner, who's making what you're making now, you will show up as a different person to be a six figure business owner. And the same will be true as you transition. Maybe one day you'll be a seven figure business owner. I don't know right now. But, you in all of those states will be different. Mm-hmm. You will level you think. up your person and yeah. your worthiness or the value that you're giving to get that back. Absolutely. Absolutely. To, to feel a sense of That's something for people to really think about. To even ask themselves, like, well, then, well what kind of person am I? Absolutely. Because it almost is like an objective metric, mm-hmm. but not on your worthiness, on your the value you're bringing to the world around you in a way. And in corporate and, and you know, traditional nine to five, I think a lot of people equate their worthiness to what their boss decides it is because that's how much money they're receiving. Mm. My boss decides how worthy I am. But what would be different if they showed up differently about that? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's that like question that I just keep asking on the podcast, which is like, how much better could your life be if you were better? We don't actually know. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're not better. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's like, but that's worth, that's actually worth thinking about because it's like, then you should scan for areas where you can make yourself better. Right. And so for people, and now I know you have a course on money. I do. Okay. Is it online or what? Actually, you want to just talk about that real quick? Yeah. It's, um, it's a real, um, easy course. It's called the Abundantly Clear Money Mindset course. Mm. And it is centered to help you start understanding money differently. You know, it's kind of an extension. This was just a very quick intro, but it's an extension of what we just talked about. But it also takes you through a belief reprogramming process to uncover what your money beliefs are, why they exist, and how to shift out of them. Um, Because you really have to do... I will say this, you really have to work through those beliefs. Like you gotta get out the pen and paper and work through this stuff. You can't just sit there and watch videos of me and expect that like that's gonna change. Um, because it is a course program and it's not something I lead firsthand, you have to show up and, and kind of work through it. But it's phenomenal and I love it. And I think that anybody who's dealing or struggling with money shame could totally benefit from it mm. yeah i'm actually gonna take it i'm excited we were just talking yesterday I was yeah like, we literally were asking like we are weirdos and when we go on dates we ask each other questions <laughs> so. yeah we were like interviewing each other about money yeah, we're, yeah, that's yeah. So yeah. Funny. i'll just i'll give you guys access to it it's fine no, no we'll buy it it's important that I buy it. It. actually so let's talk about you deserve it, it. <laughs> so that's really interesting too which is um this is something in the clarity academy that i've seen um, I was struggling because I have family members that could really benefit from the Clarity Academy. Mm-hmm. And I know they could benefit. 
But I don't know that they get the benefit if they didn't invest in themselves to spend the money to get there. And I know that probably yeah. sounds like me just justifying no, my price. No, I understand that. But in my in my life, that was actually the thing. It was like I realized until I like invested in myself, mm-hmm. I didn't actually get what I was after mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Yep. No, that's really true. Um, and a lot of times, it's kind of crazy. It's almost like... I don't know if the word miracle resonates with you at all, but I see these like tiny little miracles with people sometimes right after they make an investment in doing one-on-one work or coaching, like something big will happen like the following week, totally. <laughs> like yeah. after the first call. And I truly believe that's not because I'm some type of miraculous person that's walking around the planet and this person just had like one call with me and now their entire life is fixed. I don't think that at all. I think they actually experienced a massive up level with themselves and they're like, oh wow. I am seeing myself through this different lens because I invested into this, you know, financial and time and I'm owning the things that maybe I need to fix and I'm seeing myself through a different lens from day one. I think Mm. there's a lot of power in that. So it's like, yeah, that's interesting. And I've never, it's like a cellular change in them. It's a biological change. Yeah. Familiar with any of Bruce Lipton's work? No. Yeah. Um, Bruce Lipton... You're, you're, you're nodding your head yes. He's like, no. I know. I, the people listening are like, I said no. And you're like, yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes yeah. and no. So we got a yes Is and he no. the one that with like the reprogramming like in the DNA structure? Yes. So Bruce Lipton has uh, actually done a little bit of stuff with Joe Dispenza. Both of them are phenomenal. And Bruce talks about how our belief system really is found at a cellular level in our DNA. And everything that we believe about ourselves is found you know not just in our minds but it is it is in every part it's in of our, our bloodstream. energy body yeah exactly the chemicals that are released based mm-hmm. on your responses based on what's going on in your life can change your life absolutely and even outside of you so i call it a superhuman suit just to give it kind of like some context we are all walking around in a superhuman suit so there's physics if you look at physics there's stuff going on outside of our skin that we're actually carrying with us wherever we go and there's a lot of like um, what? What do you energy, mean? right? Yeah. We can see, yeah, it's energy. Okay. So we can see it on. Uh, for people like me that have no context for what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, for like the listener. But also for me, what do you mean? So when we look at physics, we're looking at more than just the biological structure of we're made of skin and hair and nails and blood and hearts and organs and all that kind of stuff. If, if you there's machines that can measure it I can't remember the names of them off the top of my head to be completely honest um, so there's but, like we radiate an energy off yeah, of our skin yeah we ra- there's a there's layers of energy off of our skin and there's Harvard studies that are um, really diving into creating instruments to be able to read that more uh, and if you think about like like is it EKG I think EKG shows that too so the stuff that we go to for um, you know looking into certain aspects of our health that's actually measuring the radiation and what's going on outside of our bodies but we're carrying that with us wherever we go but we think about ourselves through the lens of we stop at our skin when we actually don't totally does that okay. make sense sure yeah okay. yeah well, and so the, about in, in like the healing environment so like whatever mm-hmm. like whatever energy has surrounded you within like a i don't know a diagnosis that's mm-hmm. a really bad prognosis if you surround yourself with healing energies around you like there's I guess studies that say like that energy can cause healing if you think there's a really simple context to put this in if you walk into a room of a couple of two like say you guys just had an argument and I walk through the door and you didn't say anything but I could feel that feeling of oh I feel like there's some tension in the room Mm. everybody can resonate with that everybody can resonate with going oh, I've definitely had experiences where I felt tension. I didn't know what was going on, but I felt that tension. That's really what we're talking about when we're looking at physics. Like you can animals feel. Mm-hmm. can feel that. Like that type of like Well, yeah, so, so animals definitely can, right? So mm-hmm. there, yeah. there's actually really good, Stanford's doing an amazing study on fear right now. Um, I, I don't want to digress too much <laughs> from that conversation, <laughs> but what is the what is the tie-in and the correlation to to money to, to this energy that we're sort of authoring into the room and into our world well it goes back to looking at what our beliefs are and if we look at what our beliefs are you know what are we projecting out so the thing that's 
that would scare me a little bit about what you said is if the if your beliefs are biologically hardwired, then it's like, or you didn't say hardwired, I just did. But if they're biology, what then aren't they hardwired? Like, what? how do we change something that's us? Blood like chemistry. Yeah, I mean, it. technically now studies are showing that we can change our biology. Mm. With your physiology. Yeah. And your responses. And like, how and so flight. how would someone go about doing that? I think if you think about two people that are struggling with, with um, like certain types of, let's see. I'm, I want to be so careful the way I say this because I just want to be really respectful. So I don't want to use cancer as that frame, but two people that are struggling with kind of like a medical issue, uh-huh. one person feels really, really negative about it and has already decided that uh, that is overtaking them. The other person is really, really positive about it and still goes at it from a lens of, um, you know, I can get through this, I'm stronger, well, you know, all of these things about how they can overcome it. Which one do you think is going to get on the other side? Totally. You're, you're looking at biology yeah. when you're doing that, but that's coming from the mind. So it's biology and thought are interconnected because of physics. Gotcha. And so do you think when it comes to reprogramming your beliefs around money, like how are you, how do you go about starting to do that? And I know there's the course and stuff, but like just low hanging fruit for people to think about. Yeah, it would go back to the same. It would actually, it would go full circle back to kind of what we were talking about at the beginning is the awareness. Do you even have any idea what your relationship with money looks like now? Like if you were to take out a piece of paper and write down, this is how I treat money. This is how I feel about money. This is how I look at money. Would it be, I treat money like it's a resource that is going to disappear in thin air. Mm -hmm. And I think money is really hard to make. And I believe that money is, that there's never gonna be enough. You know, do you even have awareness to what that looks like at first? So one of the ways that I like to talk about it is, do you treat it like it's it's a girlfriend? Like, do you guys treat it like you treat each other? Do you treat it like somebody that you really love and care about? That's or do you enough. treat it... <laughs> well, we don't because of the stigma in society, which right. is you cannot love money. Right. Exactly. Or are you treating it like a bad ex-girlfriend or boyfriend that you hate that you never want to talk to ever again? <laughs> right. Right. Well, and I think the thing that we think about is it's inanimate, so it doesn't matter if we mm-hmm. think about it that way, right? Right. That's my belief. <laughs> It's, it's really hard to conceptualize in my brain. It, I, it is. I know. It is. We because it's not student linear. student loans. And mm-hmm. I'm like, but it's not. Like, I didn't give somebody that. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like, I never even saw it. Like, it was literally just a number on my mix account. <laughs> the computer. I'm like, what is this? I can't even conceptualize this amount of money in my brain. I've never even seen that much money. But I, yet, I owe that money. What? It's like space. I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. know. It can be hard. I think a lot of business owners go through that too with debt and feeling as if they're never going to, you know, they're never going to get to the other side. Right. Yeah. But it's all perception. Yeah. But again, the perception for people in our society is that if you love money, you're bad. And I guarantee mm-hmm. even you talking mm-hmm. about that, treating it like a boyfriend or girlfriend that you love, whatever. I guarantee there's all kinds of visceral reactions right now. Oh, I know. I know. There's driving. people on this podcast that are probably like, oh, this woman, all she does is she loves money and this yeah. is like the weirdest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, what do you say to that? <laughs> and that was very uncomfortable to start talking talking about money publicly because I do feel like our relationships with money are very toxic and we don't talk about it enough. And because of that, it's something that we're not allowing ourselves to heal. Hmm. And at the end of the day, we are who we are. I am not somebody that... I'm not just, at the end of the day, I'm not just somebody that worries about creating a lot of money. I am somebody that really wants to make an impact on the planet, as I believe that both of you are too. And I want to continue to show up every single day to help people. Do I receive money in exchange for that? Absolutely, Mm -hmm. I do. Because I think I deserve the money that I receive. But it took me a long time to see it that way. I used to look at the business from a very linear perspective of I have to create something that receives something. And I was disconnecting myself from the entire entity when I think there really is no difference. You are you are the person that's receiving it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, I'm just... But it doesn't change you, right? So you being you at your core and at your heart... That doesn't change just because there's more numbers in your bank account. Right. So it's like you're wor- you are worthy of it, but it doesn't define your worth. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Exactly. 
Well, and I mean, it's a great way to put it. It's just such a that's such a difficult thing for people to to come to grips with in their mind. I Mm -hmm. think because we do have such an adversarial relationship with money. We do, and we shame a lot of people that make a lot of money. So there, I'll give you a example of. And I know we're wrapping up, but I'll give you an example of something I was just thinking about a couple days ago. I went to um, the Tesla Gigafactory in Reno over the weekend with some a little small mastermind group. And Elon has had he's had a bit, pretty bad rep throughout the last couple of years. I don't know if you're familiar with Elon Musk if you're listening I've to this podcast yeah. and <laughs> like some just crap that he's done, but. Most people look at business owners that are making multi-billions of dollars and just think they're the worst people on the planet. Well, the culture of this company going through this tour and learning, Teslas are not, the Tesla, the company, you just think of like a, a car, right? If you're even familiar with what a Tesla is, you just think of a car. This company is literally creating sustainable resources to help heal the entire planet. I mean, they're creating resources that are gonna help islands that don't have access to electricity. They are uh, giving millions of dollars into education systems. They're helping in, uh, kids become engineers from middle school so that they have jobs leading outside of school so that they don't have to pay for college and that they have something laid out for them. I mean, the amount of stuff that the company is doing is like blew my mind. Mm. And all of that is from somebody that's created a very successful business and he's giving a lot to the planet and the company culture is incredible and the morale and the way that people have the ability to grow. But we don't have a tendency to look at people on our planet like that and go, wow, I wonder about all the things that he or she has accomplished. So the stigma of the brand Mm -hmm. that society perceives it as is greater than the mission of the company. Exactly. We just look. I mean, it's that is what society does is we just go, oh, yeah, he's just he's he's made a lot of money. But if you really look at what a lot of these companies are doing, it's really profound and impactful work on this planet. And it's it's mind blowing. I think that comes down to like business owners, too, is just like making sure that they like hammer, like not not only their mission, but like their brand and, mm-hmm. and like just really preach that absolutely make, make it like a really true organic message most that, people like, we're are here not, to help the planet yeah. you know we're here to help humans you know most people are not waking up to do what they do every single day because of money it's not really a driver for most people you know it's it really is to help people yeah you know it's not <laughs> but i also think that 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 the work the work, the work proposition in most nine to five wouldn't take place if money weren't the driver and on some level because mm-hmm. what I realize in, in my entrepreneurial world is like I, and this could be more of my just personality, but I went to take jobs on different places I've been simply to meet people because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I just want to like, it's hard as an entrepreneur. My hobby is running. Like everything I do is by myself. So if I want to meet people, I have to really get out there. So it's like, I'll take jobs. And I was like, oh, I realized instantly like, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's stupid. You know, and that's, that's my entrepreneur side. But I also realized like, oh, this proposition only works if I need you. You can only be a dick. Like you can only say dumb shit to me and I'll listen if I need you for some reason. And since I don't, I'm leaving. And I realized that like, really funny. yeah. And, rebellion. <laughs> right. And that, that just. You like, like to break the rules. <laughs> that, is, that is also true. Rebellion yeah. And also not for another tangent, not to get too far, but. Elon Musk, for being so introverted and such an engineering type mind, mm-hmm. is really good at building cultures, and I think mm-hmm. that's a that's probably a byproduct of him being really good at putting the right people around him. Right, right, um, right. But I I was offered a job at SpaceX when I got out of the military, and their culture was just incredible as well. It like, really, so mission yeah, driven. it really is. Very, but if you think about like the last couple articles you've seen of him on the in the news in the last nine months, it's been you know. Yeah. Total judgment zone. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we love to take our gods down, right? We love yeah. to take our legends so down and our heroes. Like, we do. We do. Yeah. I mean, it's like our favorite. It's how bad can we make people look? Totally. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. really crazy. Yeah, to prop <laughs> ourselves up, our lack of self. Yeah. But I think that you know what that all comes down to, to me it seems like, and, and you can tell me if you agree or not, but to me it seems like money is just, it's a, it's going to extend who you are. Like it's going to magnify your character. I think it absolutely does. I think that's all it does. Right. It's like there are, you know, there are greedy, dick, head, rich people. There are a 
ton of dickhead poor people. They and they're going to be, yeah, <laughs> like, take all the money away from the greedy dickhead rich people, they're still going to be greedy dickhead rich people. Like, right. that doesn't define it. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, right. totally. And so I think that is part of, I think if people were to come to grips with that, it's like, yeah, you could have money and actually just do more of the good that you want to do in the world. Mm-hmm. And then that would, uh, that would help start to change that conversation a little bit, I think. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Cool. So on the last show that I had, <laughs> the last show, it's this show, but it used to be called Lionheart Radio, we would do this <laughs> final question where we would be like, um, if you could give advice guaranteed that it would uh, reach everybody in the world and be translated to every language, they might not hear it, but mm. they would definitely follow your advice uh, based on everything that you've learned. It can be life, it could be money, it could be business, it could be mindset. What advice would you give to people? That is a really great question. I love that you do that. Um, I would give the advice to ask yourself the simple question, why do I believe this is true? Why do I believe this mm-hmm. is true? So go to your inner dialogue and the things that you ask, the things that you say to yourself all day long, interject it with a question of why do I believe this is true? And just start playing with that and start getting curious of why, why is my programming the way that it is? Where did I learn this? Why do I tell myself this every day? Why am I experiencing this this way? Can really be prompted from the question of why do I believe this is true? Mm. It's, what, what do people find with that? That, that oh, it's not man. true? That they don't um, think it's true? Yeah, usually that it's not true. Because that's but my they need thought to right now. Yeah, but they need to understand why. Well, I believe this is true. I believe that it's really... What's a, what's a good example? I believe that I can't do this because I grew up in a household that mom and dad said that I couldn't use my voice and that I always needed to be quiet and that I couldn't be creative. And so I have uh, grown up into adulthood and not allowed myself to experience my self-expression. Do you feel like you need self-awareness or a mirror for someone to present you with that truth before you even ask if it's true? I think both. I think both. I think it's going to happen a hell of a lot quicker if you have somebody else. Like, yeah, it's going to happen a hell of a lot quicker. Because typically people don't even know what's Mm -hmm. true and what's not. Right? But if you start getting curious to what what your inner dialogue is, that will at least help for the first step. Because without awareness, you can't do anything. It kind of pulls a thread on the belief. Yeah. That's almost what I'm... Because exactly. that question just kind of hit me hard. And like, <laughs> well, we, we had all day today, actually, we were struggling. Like I was talking about these like patternings that I've spent so much work to overcome. Yet sometimes it just feels like it just pulls me right back in. Mm-hmm. Like for whatever reason, like sometimes it's almost like I'll get so, f- I'll be doing so well. Mm-hmm. And it's like almost the inverse of that hits me. It's like that weight hits me of like, oh man, maybe I'm not fully over then over this patterning Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. but then when I ask myself well why do I believe this is true like at least for me the first answer is like well because people told you it was true your entire Mm -hmm. fucking life yep yep exactly (laughs) that doesn't actually mean it's true at all it has nothing to do with truth right that just means that's what someone said to you exactly Mm. yeah that's exactly where I was going with that dope all right I'm gonna let people I'm gonna end there and just let people (laughs) wrestle with that (laughs) for people that are listening to this and they want to follow along with what you're doing or support you or even work with you is there any Mm -hmm. way for them to do that or what would be the best yeah the best way to do that is to you can find me on my podcast which you have uh, already told them about so thank you for doing that abundantly clear podcast and the quickest and easiest way to get to my website is to go to abundantlyclearpodcast.com and that will take you to the podcast page and then you can hop over to um, the home page or the contact me page if you want to find me. My first name is a little hard to spell. So just go to abundantlyclearpodcast.com and then you can get there. Perfect. I need a dollar, dollar.
Well, I need a dollar, 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 that's what I need. Hey, hey. Said I need a dollar, 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 that's what I need. Hey, hey. And I need a dollar, 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 that's what I need. And if I share with you my story, would you share your dollar with me? Well, I don't know if I'm walking on solid ground. Cause everything around me is crumbling down. Maybe it's inside the bottle. Maybe it's inside the bottle. I had some good old buddies. Names is whiskey and wine. Hey, hey. And for my good old buddies, I spent my last dime. Hey, hey. Now wine is good to me. You help me pass the time. And my good old buddy whiskey keep me warm and in sunshine. Hey, hey. Your mama may have blessed the child. I need